everyone, I'm Annika and I'm Ventures VP of Development this semester. And I'm Sarah, Ventures VP External this semester. Today we're going to be going through a mock case interview with Sarah who's consulted for Venture and is going to be working at BCG this summer. And we'll be doing the Lonely Gas Station case which is adapted from the Darden casebook. We also recommend pausing after each case question and practicing answering it yourself. And lastly, there's a lot of correct ways to approach a case. So this is just one example. And with that, we'll get right into it. Hi, Sarah, I'm Annika. Nice to meet you and welcome to Ventures Individual Interview. Hi, I'm Sarah, nice to meet you as well. Um, with that, we'll dive right into our prompt for today. So our client is the owner of a gas station between towns A and B. 10 miles to each town. He's wondering if it would make sense to add a convenience store to the gas station. Awesome. Um, thank you for you know, giving me this prompt. So just to start with reiterating the question, um, you said that the owner is, um, or the owner of a gas station has asked us for help um, to figure out whether or not we should add a convenience store to the gas station. Um, is that correct? Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I have a few clarifying questions about this prompt, starting with um, the competitive landscape. So are there any other gas stations that we are aware of, um, either in town A or B or between those two towns? Um, and also, do we know the competitive landscape of convenience stores within these two towns? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are currently no other gas stations in town A or B. And those are the current customers of the gas stations is the residents only of town A and B. And we don't have any information at this time about the convenience store competitive landscape. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, thank you for answering that question. I was wondering as well, um, what kind of services do we currently offer? Are we really just focusing on gas um, or do we offer any other services such as um, like car services? car washing, et cetera? Yeah, that's also a great question. So we do also offer car washes in addition to gas. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and then my final question just has to do with the goal itself. Um, so I know we're trying to figure out if we should expand or not, but what is the overarching goal when we're thinking about this? What is our priority? Um, is it making as much profit as possible? Is it um, gaining a lot of customers? Is it diversifying our income? Like where, which direction are we leaning in? Because um, that would be really helpful in this case. Yeah, so we have three big goals. The first is making profit. The second is having a better chance to hold off new competitors entering the market. And the last is to diversify our income. Would you mind if I took um, a minute to structure my thoughts and think about the framework with which to um, talk about this case? Yeah, of course. We just went through the case question with Sarah and now we are going to talk about the way she approached the problem. So on the left side is the case question as well as the given information. And that is just for your reference. We're going to go through the way Sarah approached this. So she asked really insightful questions that gave her the additional information that you see on the left. And for you guys, when you're approaching a case, first start by understanding the objective and the overarching goals. So for example, is there a specific target you're trying to meet? Is it just about reaching profitability? What's the end goal of the client? Because not every client has the same one. And then the second one is understanding who the client is and how they make money. So make sure you understand the business model because if you think of a gas station, you might just think they're selling gas, but once Sarah asked some questions, she realized that they also have car washes, which was an entire 25% of how they're making money. And then lastly, lots of times people new to casing will ask how many questions are good to ask. More than three to four is probably not necessary, Cases do have a different amount of additional information that you might need. So it's okay if sometimes you ask more or less, and it's also okay if the interviewer doesn't answer all your questions. Awesome, so I'm ready to kind of present my initial thinking, my initial framework. Um, so since the question is whether or not we should expand, um, I divided my 
thinking into two main buckets, the external as well as the internal. Um, and starting with your external factors, we have our market as well as customers, which is something that we um, have to think about. So in terms of market, um, I know we talked about our competition. We know that there's no other gas station, um, but I would really like to learn more um, about the convenience store market and really understand what the competition is within those um, stores. And then another thing that has to do with market is the population. So is our population growing in town A or B or is it slowly de declining? Um, and what are the different preferences of these customers when it comes to gas? Are more people buying cars or are people kind of getting rid of their cars? Um, and that will be very helpful in determining how many um, customers we can expect in the future um, and who will come get gas and who will come buy um, products from our convenience store. So that's kind of the market aspect of external factors. And then within the customer aspect of the um, external factor, really understanding customers will help us determine what specifically to sell in the convenience store, um, as well as figure out whether um, our customers would be willing to change from the convenience store that they're working in or going into right now um, to the one that we're, we will be opening up. Um, so those are kind of the external factors. And then looking into the internal bucket, um, we have our client's capabilities as well as the client's financials. Um, starting with our capabilities, it's important to consider whether we have enough knowledge of convenience stores to be able to actually open one, um, as well as the additional workforce that it's gonna take um, to operate this, this convenience store, um, as well as kind of finding a manager who's actually gonna take responsibility for operating it. Um, and finally, we also wanna make sure that we have the necessary suppliers um, to be able to supply our store with the necessary product. Um, so that's kind of the capability aspect that I'd like to consider as well. And then finally, um, I really want to look into financials because I do think that's probably one of the most important factors in our decision. Um, so, you know, in terms of financials, want to look into revenues first and then looking at costs. Um, so for revenues, now we know that um, we sell gas and car washing. Um, so after we actually open um, the store, I'd like to just understand what the additional revenues um, will be and maybe what the additional or how many extra customers are we going to be able um, to have now that we are offering more services. And then in terms of costs, um, we have to really think about labor, we have to think about the utilities, we have to think about rent, um, as well as kind of the cost of goods sold when we're thinking about opening this convenience store, um, as well as the initial investment that will have to go into this project. Um, that was a lot of information. That is kind of the way I'm thinking about it. Um, I was wondering if we could start with the financials because um, I do think that's probably going to be one of the most important considerations. Um, do you think that's a good place for me to start? Yeah, that was a really comprehensive framework. And I think that thinking about the financials is a good place to start. So Sarah just finished walking us through her framework. And you can see it on the left for reference, and we're going to talk about the way she approached it. So she broke down her framework into separate branches or buckets, which is a very organized way of thinking that you want to use when you're doing any type of qualitative question in a case. So you can notice with the internal and external buckets, there's subcategories such as market and customers under external. And then under that, there's also additional factors and these factors tend to not overlap. So the good thing about external and internal is they're exclusive to each other. So between the two, you cover every aspect of a business. And so that brings us into the next part of the analysis, which is that when you're thinking about ways to split up your buckets, using opposites, if it's just two categories, like financial and non-financial, for example, is a good approach. You can also split it into the different components of a business, the last piece of this analysis is that you want to make sure the framework is tied to the case. So online, you can find different consulting frameworks that are generally used to approach a certain type of case. So for example, a marketing case. But if you get a marketing case, you don't want to just use that framework. You want to customize it to your case. So you can see here that when she discusses Competitors. She doesn't talk about it vaguely. She specifically ties it to convenience stores, which is the case at hand. I would say that one thing that we want to consider is how profitable the current business is within financials. Okay. 
Um, so when you're asking that question, are you asking per year? Um, yeah, are you asking the profitability of the business per year? Yes, per year would be good. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess I will need some additional information. So um, some of the things that I'm looking to know is if we have any information on the number of customers um, that we currently have, um, and if we have any information on, um, you know, how often these customers go to the gas station, how much do they spend when they come to our gas station, as well as, um, you know, how much of, of that percentage goes towards um, the car wash as opposed to the, um, the gas. So do we have any information, any of those numbers? Yeah, so those are all good questions. There's a thousand people in each town. Customers get gas on average once a week. And you can think about it in terms of 50 weeks a year. You don't need to do 52. And every time they spend $50 on average and they make 40% of all gas purchases at the client station. And then you also asked about the breakdown between car washes and gas. And so gas is 75% of revenue with a 10% profit margin and the car washes are 25% of revenue. So the rest of it with a 20% profit margin. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that a thousand people live in each town. Um, do all these thousand people go to the gas station? Do all of these have a car or is there also um, a kind of percentage for that or a consideration that I should keep in mind? Yeah, that's a great question. Only 80% of the population owns a car and 50% of these car owners get their gas from our client. Okay. Um, can I just have a minute to think about how I would approach this question? Yeah. Um, okay, I'd like to just walk you through my approach. Um, and then I'll do the calculations later. So starting with my approach, I'd like to first figure out the customer base. Um, so just how many customers are actually, um, you know, coming into our store. Um, and then I'd like to figure out the spending per customer per year, um, multiply that by the customer base. Um, and that will just give us the overall revenue. And then from there, I'd divide the revenue into the revenue for gas, as well as the revenue for car washing um, and using the profit margin would figure out what our profit is from that revenue. Um, does that sound like a good approach? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Um, okay, so starting with the market and the customer base, we have two towns of a thousand people um, and 80% of those people own a car, 50% of car, car, car owners get gas. So if we multiply two times 1,000 times 80% times 50%, we get a customer base of um, about 800. Um, and so that's kind of the customer base that we have. And then in terms of the revenue, um, we know we're spending 50 um, once a week for 50 weeks a year. Um, and only 40% of gas purchases are made at clients. Uh, so once again, multiplying all those numbers, um, we're getting $8,000 um, and multiplying 800 by 1,000, we're getting the overall revenue per year for this gas station to be $800,000. Um, so that's kind of the overall revenue. And then dividing that into 75% um, for gas, um, we're getting $600,000 for gas, dollars, $600,000 for gas um, with a 10% profit margin. That gives us a profit of $60,000. Um, and then if we make that same calculation for um, the car wash, um, we get that 20% of the profit margin um, of $200,000, which is the revenue for the car wash would be $40,000. Um, so we get a total of $100,000 as our profit per year, um, which is relatively considerable. Um, and it seems like this is a fairly profitable business, but I would like to kind of understand the comparison of this um, with other numbers, such as what it would look like if we added the gas station or the convenience store um, to really make any conclusions. On the left is the given information of the case. 
In the middle are Sarah's calculations, which functions as an answer key for the case, and you can check it with your own work. On the right is Sarah's approach. So notice how she walked me through her math before she actually started doing the calculations in the middle. This is important because although her approach was correct, if it hadn't been, I would have had the opportunity to correct her before she wasted too much time. The second thing is she rounded numbers to make the calculations faster, which is something that we encourage all applicants to do as long as it's a reasonable rounding. Yeah, that's a great direction that we want to go in. So the second question for you is how profitable the convenience store would be on an ongoing basis. Um, and we're thinking about just the convenience store taking away anything like gas station related. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, Awesome. Let me think about some other information that I need. Um, do we have any information on how much, how much additional revenue our customers, our existing customers going to spend um, because of this convenience store? Yes. So they'll spend an additional $20 at the convenience store per purchase, but they're not going to increase their frequency of purchases. And are we going to be losing any existing customers because, you know, there might be longer lines or people might not like the fact that there's a convenience store or should I just assume that our current and existing customer base is the same? Yeah, so our customer base will change a little bit because 50% of the town population are not customers right now and they will spend $5 a week at the convenience store. So it will actually be expanding. Okay, so 50% of the non-customers will be spending $5 per week. Yep. Okay. Um, and then just in terms of the additional costs, um, do we have any information on those? Is there going to be any additional costs for maybe rent or for labor, um, as well as like how much will the, the, the goods actually um, cost? Yeah, so there's three main reoccurring costs. The first is labor, which will be $75,000 a year. The second is utilities, which will be $5,000 a month. And then the last is cost of goods sold, which will be 50% of our revenue. Okay. Um, can I just have about 30 seconds to once again, think about how I'm gonna approach this question? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so, just the general approach of this question is that I'm going to first look at our existing customers and calculate um, the revenue, the additional revenue um, that our existing customers are going to generate. Then I'm going to look into our new customers and figure out that additional revenue. Um, and finally, from that overall additional revenue, I'm going to subtract all the additional costs of opening up the convenience store. Um, does that sound like the right approach? Yeah, the approach sounds good. Starting with our existing customers, we know that we have a customer base of 800 um, from our previous calculations. Um, and since the frequency is the same, um, they're coming to make a purchase uh, once a week for 50 weeks, weeks per year um, and spending $20 per purchase. Um, so that gives us, um, so multiplying all those numbers as well as multiplying them by 40%, since those are, that's the percentage of purchases made at clients, um, we get $320,000 in additional revenue from our existing customers. Um, and then in terms of our new customers, so you said 50% of non-customers, so that means 50% of 1,200 customers. Um, so that's the number of customers. And then once a week, oh, once again, they're making a purchase of $5 um, once a week for 50 weeks. So multiplying 1,200 by 50% uh, by 50 by $5 <laughs> gets us um, $150,000 in revenue. So adding those two numbers up, adding 320,000 with 150,000, we get 470,000 as our total revenue. Um, so the next step would be to think about the profit. So we have to subtract um, the costs from our revenues. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna take into account the cost of goods sold, which are 50% of the revenue, um, so 50% of 470,000 
is 235,000 and then subtracting 75,000 for labor as well as 60,000 per year um, for utility gets me to um, $100,000 per year. Um, so this number means that basically adding a convenience store will double our profits. Um, and we're gonna get an additional profit of 100,000 per year. And that is very, um, that is a very large sum because um, we are basically doubling up our profit. So that's definitely um, a reason why I would recommend that we do add that convenience store um, and kind of go through with that project. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. The next question that Sarah did was about the profitability of the convenience store. Again, you have the given information of the case, her calculations, and we're going to discuss it now in the context of the case. So notice how she didn't just give her final numerical answer. She actually talked about how it relates to the greater context of the case, which shows that she's pushing it forward and she's able to connect different parts of information in the case to each other. She's not just approaching this as a math problem in a vacuum. And then to add on to the previous question as well, it's okay to get a math question wrong. There's a lot of people that move through our interview process after getting the wrong final answer because they walk the interviewer through their thinking. And it's understandable that sometimes when you're doing this many calculations relatively quickly, you might mess up somewhere along the way. So our next question is a little bit more big picture and qualitative. The client would like a list of things to consider when making this decision. Um, you can take a few moments to think about it, and then I would love to hear some of your ideas. Um, I'm just going to take a minute to think through. Um, so when thinking about the other things to consider, I would actually like to revisit my original framework. Um, because I think we kind of covered the financials, but we didn't really cover the other three um, buckets that I laid out, which was which were customers, market, as well as kind of capabilities within the internal bucket. Um, so once again, looking externally, in terms of our market, um, I kind of mentioned the idea of competition. So we do want to understand our comp competition, which is kind of one thing to consider. Um, but we also might want to consider what will um, the effect of us opening this convenience store be on um, the other kind of stores in town and whether maybe um, they're not going to be new entrants because of the fact that we're opening this um, convenience store. And that's something that we would want to avoid. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking about when it comes to market is just the regulatory environment. Um, so, you know, do we need a license um, to actually open up a convenience store? What does the process look like? Um, how long will we have to go through this process to actually um, get to the convenience store and how much will it cost? Um, and do we have anybody who's going to do this process or like carry this process through? Um, so those are some, kind of some, some thoughts I had about the regulatory environment. Um, the next thing that I'm thinking about are customers, um, which is once again within our external buckets. Um, so, you know, some considerations to think about is that for our current customers, um, we're definitely increasing the convenience. Um, we might even be increasing their frequency um, of visiting this gas station because now they have a convenience store. Um, but maybe one thing that we have to think about is um, the fact that there might be longer waiting times now that more people and more cars are coming into this gas station. So we do wanna make sure um, that by opening this convenience store, we're not actually letting some of our existing customers go. Um, and then in terms of our new customers, that really just is an opportunity um, because all these people who wouldn't have gone before are now suddenly coming to our gas station because of this convenience store. Um, so that's kind of some things to consider within the external bucket. And then going back into our internal bucket and thinking about capabilities, um, one thing to think about is space. Um, do we have enough space for um, displaying our products on shelves? And do we have enough space to store our products? Because um, all of these things are required to operate um, a, a convenience store. So that's something to, to really think about. Um, do we have the right people to, to manage the store and to be kind of a store manager? Um, and once again, that idea of the longer lines, like how are we going to staff um, our convenience store to make sure that we're avoiding um, long lines? So yeah, those are some, some things that I was thinking about initially 
um, when thinking about this problem. Yeah, those, that's a great list of considerations. For question three, Sarah gave a list of considerations, which you can see on the left. And notice how she again used the bucket method, which we talked about after the framework question. This type of structure makes her answer really easy to follow. And you can also tell that she took this opportunity to be creative. We definitely want to see your creative side and what types of ideas you come up with. And so don't be afraid to throw something a little more out there into your list of considerations when you're doing qualitative brainstorms. So you're actually getting a call right now from the CEO and he wants to hear a summary of what you've been working on. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I would definitely recommend that we do add the convenience store. Um, and that is for multiple reasons. So first of all, we calculated that there's going to be an additional profit of $100,000 per year if we did open this convenience store, which would basically double up our profits from what they were like now. Um, so that's really impressive. And then, um, so that definitely um, adds to the goal of increasing profit that we laid out at the beginning of this case. Um, one of our other goals was diversifying income. Um, and by opening a convenience store, we're doing exactly that. We're finding new ways of um, bringing profit and bringing revenues into our company. Um, and those new ways are different um, and new. Um, so that's something that's um, also kind of fits one of the goals that we established in the beginnings. Some of the risks that I see with opening up this convenience store um, is that we might bring additional competition to the towns um, because they're going to see how well we're doing. Um, so I think one way to mitigate that um, would be to really think about um, differentiating ourselves. What can we offer that is different? Um, that could be in terms of products. It could be in terms of opening hours. Um, it could be in terms of setup. Like, what are we doing um, where we make ourselves unique um, and special? And then another, another risk that I was thinking about and that I mentioned before would be losing some existing customers because of the longer lines. Um, and I think a good way to mitigate that would just be make, to make sure that we're, um, we're staffing enough people um, and we're giving comprehensive trainings um, so that the line is moving quickly um, and efficiently. Um, but yeah, it was a pleasure to um, do this case for you. And um, I'm excited to hear about what happens with a lonely gas station. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. That wraps up the case. So that wraps up the case. Sarah's conclusion was extremely structured and we find this to be a formula that's often used where you start with the problem and give your recommendation to solve it. And then you give a couple of reasons why. And then lastly, you give a risk and a mitigation for the risk or a next step. The reason for giving a risk is because any plan is going to have a downside to it. And as a consultant, you have to be able to recognize what the potential risks of your plan are so that the client is well prepared. And then next steps are also really important because you want them to be able to take action based on your recommendation. So for example, if you recommend a business to launch a new product, but you don't tell them how they can start doing that, then the recommendation is not as helpful. So Lastly, when you're giving your recommendation, make sure that it's very succinct and answering exactly what the client was curious about. Don't recap the whole case. The client is going to know the problem when you're presenting to them, and so there's no reason to repeat it all back to them. So that wraps up our case. Thank you so much for joining us, and please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions about our recruitment process. We want to make it as smooth as possible.